Hi, I'm Abby Dernberg. In the previous two segments, I've introduced you to the process of meiosis, the process by which homologous chromosomes separate to different daughter cells to produce haploid gametes, or sex cells. And I've told you a little bit about what homologous chromosomes have to do to accomplish the segregation. They have to pair, synapse, and undergo crossover recombination. And I introduced you to the special regions that we call pairing centers, which are on each of the six chromosomes in C. elegans that play critical roles in the process of pairing and synapsis. These chromosome regions recruit uh, special proteins uh, that, that have zinc fingers that bind to short sequence motifs, and they interact with the nuclear envelope. And that's essential for uh, chromosomes to undergo pairing and synapsis. And we want to understand what it is about these interactions with the nuclear envelope that promote uh, the pairing and synapsis of homologous chromosomes. So one of the first uh, key observations that, that pushed this work forward was kind of fortuitous. And I'll show you what we saw. Um, when we localize the, the pairing centers, here using antibodies against all of the zinc finger proteins um, in red, what we see is that they're distributed um, sort of uh, apparently randomly around the nuclear periphery. Um, and we wanted to know what they were interacting with. And we, our, our first clue was really just an accident. We, we had a, a protein um, that, we, uh, that had been tagged with GFP, green fluorescent protein, by other researchers who were working on the nuclear envelope and its role in other processes. Um, and they were studying this protein called Zyg12, it stands for zygotic lethal, because this is an essential protein um, that's a component of the nuclear envelope. When we looked at Zyg12 in early meiotic nuclei, it precisely co-localized with these pairing centers, suggesting that there might be an interaction between the pairing centers and Zyg12. So what is Zyg12? So it turns out that Zyg12 is something called a cache domain protein. And cache domain proteins all share this, this property that they are recruited and, and retained in the nuclear envelope, the outer nuclear envelope, by interaction with something called the sun domain protein. So sun domain proteins are an anchor. They're in the inner nuclear envelope. They bind to cache domain proteins. And then cache domain proteins can interact with different elements in the, in the cytoplasm, um, such as the actin cytoskeleton or the microtubule cytoskeleton. And they connect, they, they structurally connect things inside the nucleus to outside the nucleus. So we were very intrigued by this, and we wanted to know what the nature of these connections was. Um, we, we could tell just by looking at, uh, at uh, C. elegans germline stained with um, antibodies or, or GFP um, that these, these uh, interactions between the chromosomes and the nuclear envelope were very transient. So we see these, these we call them patches of Zyg12 that co-localize with the pairing centers, but they, they only appear for a brief window of time at, my, at the beginning of meiotic prophase. And then by the time the chromosomes complete pairing and synapses, Zyg12 dissociates from the pairing centers and redistributes throughout the nuclear envelope. So we wanted to know more about the architecture of these interactions and what they do. Um, and a, a, a lot of experiments from my lab and other labs have revealed that in meiosis, what happens is the zinc finger proteins, HIM8 or the ZIM proteins, are recruited to the pairing centers. And uh, th by recruiting um, regulatory activities like kinases, they induce the aggregation of SUN1 and Zyg12 within the nuclear envelope to form these patches that we can actually see. And we also knew from previous work that Zyg12 interacts with the microtubule cytoskeleton. It, it inter interacts with the microtubule motor dynein and with microtubules. And this was very intriguing. And it's very reminiscent uh, of, of something that we knew happens during meiosis in many organisms. So these pairing centers are a little bit odd. This is not a general feature of meiosis. But, but this interaction between chromosomes and the nuclear envelope does seem to be a, a ubiquitous aspect of meiotic prophase. And, and the more typical way it looks is something like this. Um, these are actually some very old uh, drawings based on observations of meiosis, in this case, in a flatworm. Um, but they exemplify the stage of meiosis called the bouquet stage. What, what early cytologists observed is that the ends of chromosomes, which we now call telomeres, associate with the nuclear envelope. And they um, often they cluster closely together um, near one portion of the nuclear envelope during meiotic prophase. And in work in the fission yeast, uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombi had revealed that um, 
in, in fission yeast, telomeres associate with the nuclear envelope um, through a, a similar Sun-Cash domain pair, SAD1 and KMS1, basically orthologous to Sun1 and Zyg12. So we think it's very likely that the, this uh, reorganization that we see and the interaction between pairing centers and the nuclear envelope is basically a, a, an evolutionary variant of the more common situation where telomeres associate with the nuclear envelope. So what does all of this do? Um, well, one way that we have explored the role of um, these interactions in promoting pairing and synapsis is to take advantage of the fact that we can actually observe meiosis in living organisms, and we can start to look at the chromosome dynamics in real time um, using fluorescent protein tags. So this shows you an early um, recording that we made in my lab. In this case, we're looking at Zyg12 GFP, so this nuclear envelope protein that's associated with all of the pairing centers. And then in red is a, a, a histone protein labeled with a, a red fluorescent protein, just so that you can identify the individual nuclei. Um, and what you see is that in these uh, early meiotic nuclei that are undergoing pairing and synapsis, these patches of Zyg12 and the associated pairing centers are dramatically moving all around the nuclear envelope. Um, and that motion becomes much less obvious, and the patches dis dissipate upon chromosome pairing and synapsis. So to, to make more sense of this motion and to understand how it might drive the interaction between homologous chromosomes, we wanted to label um, just the X chromosome pairing centers. And, and to do that, um, Dave Wynn, a graduate student in my lab, made a hemate GFP fusion. So now we can just observe the, the pairing centers on the X chromosome. And in this movie, um, we've also taken advantage of the fact that the X chromosome replicates later than all the other chromosomes in the germline, um, because it's uh, transcriptionally silent and heterochromatic. And so if we inject into worms uh, a DNA precursor, a fluorescent DNA precursor, a deoxynucleotide, it gets incorporated into replicating DNA. And in many nuclei, you preferentially label the X chromosomes. And I really love watching this movie because it's just a view of individual chromosomes in motion, which is just something that we haven't had the opportunity to look at really before. And I wanted to just point out a couple of, of, of interesting features. So in most of these meiotic nuclei, what you see is um, that the HIM-8 GFP focus, it's at the nuclear envelope, and it's dramatically moving around the, the, the nuclear surface. Um, the rest of the chromosome is not really following it um, like a rigid rod, the, the chromosomes are very flexible and elastic. And so really most of the motion is at that left end of the X chromosome where the pairing center is. And in a couple of nuclei, there's one example, there's one over here, where the X chromosomes have paired at their pairing centers, but they haven't zipped up yet through formation of the synaponemal complex. So we're catching an intermediate in this process of pairing and synapsis. So we really wanted to understand the nature of these motions. And that turned out to be a lot harder than we'd expected to sort of analyze quantitatively. Um, and I'll show you why. So we, we, can, we can observe these motions. And we're using um, fairly high speed fluorescence microscopy here, um, where we're taking 3D data, because we really need to capture the full 3D volume. Uh, but the fastest we could really image these, these, um, these samples was at about a five second interval between successive frames. And at that frame rate, what we would see is that these spots were moving around dramatically. And we could easily track these spots using uh, software. And we could um, tell very easily that in, um, in early meiosis, in these transitions of nuclei, which are undergoing pairing, these spots are extremely active. Um, so the pairing centers are moving around very actively, and, and much more so than in premeiotic nuclei. And we could track these spots and, and kind of demonstrate that in a quantitative way. Um, but what we also realized in the course of doing this work was that we weren't imaging fast enough. And by that, I mean that if you watch one of these spots, for, and, and basically this trace shows its position from um, in each frame of the movie, what you see is its position, it, it doesn't have uh, any kind of constant trajectory. Um, its direction seems to change with each, each successive frame. And that means we're not sampling fast enough to actually see motion and to measure the, the rate of motion. Um, and that might be a little non-intuitive, but I, I'm just going to use this example of uh, time-lapse photography of people moving around Grand Central Station. Now, if it takes someone, on average, like a minute to go from one side of this hall to the other, and you only take an image every minute or every 30 seconds, you're lucky to see that same person 
even twice um, in, in one frame and the next frame. In order to really um, measure the rate of someone's motion through, um, through space, you have to actually be able to see them through multiple frames to be able to actually measure the rate of, of their motion. And so we realized that we were undersampling the motion that we were trying to, to capture. And to fill in the gaps, we went to um, a higher frame rate where we were simply taking individual frames, not trying to capture the full 3D volume of the nucleus. And in these, these faster movies, now we could see um, these persistent or processive chromosome motions that we could track over multiple frames. And so we could actually measure their velocity and their duration and so forth. Um, and what we found is that they, um, they show behavior typical of motor-driven motion um, in that the duration of these motions uh, shows an exponential decay. Um, we can't measure the shortest motions because they're still too, the, the, the duration is still too short compared to our frame rate. But the longer motions where we can track um, a single pairing center moving over multiple frames, we could measure their duration. And from this curve, we can calculate that these motions last an average of a little under two seconds. So really, to get the full picture of what's going on, we'd really like to have even faster microscopy. Um, and that's something that is constantly being improved. Um, so we're hopeful that someday we'll be able to understand this process in more detail. Um, we could tell that these, these long-range motions, which sometimes move chromosomes like halfway across the nucleus around the, the periphery, depended on the microtubule motor dynein. So here, what we've done is taken a worm that's, that has a temperature-sensitive mutation in one dynein component, and we've done RNAi against another dynein component to try to knock down the activity as strongly as possible. And what we see is that the, the long-range motions disappear. And that's kind of shown here in this graph that the, the, the apparent motions um, of, of more than about half a micron from one frame to the next disappear. Nevertheless, um, if, you're, if you're looking at this, you might be wondering, well, these spots don't look unpaired. So even though these motions are clearly upregulated during meiosis, and the, the most obvious thing that, that they would be doing is helping chromosomes to find their partners, they are actually dispensable for homolog pairing. We see a slight delay in homolog pairing in the absence of dynein activity, but it's not gone. And that's sort of surprising, but it's consistent with what we had seen through other assays. So what is it that makes chromosomes pair in this region, even in the absence of dynein? And, and we're still working on the answer to that question. But one clue came from, from analysis of the kinds of movies that I've, I've shown you. Um, these are basically individual tracks um, of, of a pairing center from a collection of, of nuclei from multiple movies. And we've overlaid, in this case, 15 individual tracks um, on the same sphere so that you can get a feel for how much chromosomes are moving around in the space of about five minutes. Um, and what I, mean, I just want to highlight is that in premiotic nuclei, um, which are on the left, the, the chromosome motion is very constrained. It's not even diffusive. So, so chromosomes are sort of um, constrained to be in, in a small region of the nucleus. They don't move much. In early meiosis, suddenly things really take off. And the chromosomes are just moving all around the nuclear surface. This probably promotes their interactions with each other. We don't think it happens in a directed way, because when we actually measure these motions, they, they, they show no directionality. And they separate homologous chromosomes as often as they bring them closer together. Um, but they clearly facilitate the exploration of space by the chromosomes. The interesting thing that I want to highlight here is that even in the absence of dynein, the motion that, that we see um, in meiotic nuclei is a lot less constrained than in the premeiotic nuclei. And what we think this is telling us is that there's a change in the whole behavior of the nuclear surface. Either the, the lamina that underlies the nuclear membranes becomes more fluid, or other changes must be happening to enable chromosomes to diffuse more readily through the nucleus. And we think that this, together with other factors, is a major determinant of homolog pairing. We're still very interested in exploring the other roles for this motion um, and, the, and how it promotes pairing and synapsis. Um, and that's very active work still going on in my lab. So stay tuned.